I'll tell you why. Jesus changed my life when I was eight years old. And I didn't know how great that was. It was just another day at camp, except I accepted Jesus. But I knew in my heart that God loved me. I, God loved me. That's just, that's just awesome. John, in his uh, little letter that he writes, uh, he wants you to really know about God's love. He wants you to know about God's love. This, this little letter is kind of cyclical. It goes through cycles, around and around. And, and you know, the key word is know. He wants you to know. I mean, really know. That word occurs almost every third verse. The word know is in this book. He really wants you to know. And so he talks about knowledge a lot. And then he talks about life a lot. He jumps into the idea of life. And then the next thing you know, he's back talking about knowing. And then it seems like the little book turns around and speaks about life again. In fact, again and again, okay? And then we notice that the book talks about love. And then he leaves that for a little while. And he goes and he talks about truth. But I mean, when he talks about truth, he says, if you really know the truth, then you're really going to know love. And he comes back and he talks about love. <laughs> it's, it's just back and forth, back and forth. Uh, he talks about truth some more. He talks about the new birth. And, and then on the other hand, he talks about family. And then after he's done talking about family, he talks about the new birth again. After the new birth, he talks about family again. And I could pick out a whole bunch of topics like this through the whole book. I mean, it just goes back and forth. He's back and forth and back and forth. And today, he's back I'm talking about God's love. He says, I just can't get away from this, this type of, of God's love. We talked about this just a couple weeks ago. We talked about five different words for love in the, the New Testament. Uh, there's a word, epithumia, which means I like you. <laughs> and we said everybody likes to be liked, right? Yeah, everybody likes to be liked. Uh, there's one that's uh, very close to that one uh, where it says that phileo, I like you back. It's reciprocal. You like me, I like you back, and that's the way friendships work. Hey, I like this guy. You know, I'm going to give him a call. Hey, I'm, and, and we do. We go back and forth. And, and we kind of even keep track. We shouldn't, but we do. Oh, they were, we were at their house last. We got to have them over to our house. You see how we do that? <laughs> it's reciprocal kind of love. Fala'o, fala'o. I like you, I like you back, you know. And, and then there's another one uh, that's storge. And storge kind of means like we belong together. We belong together. We, we covered this a couple weeks ago. It, it's that when two people, a, a guy and a gal, uh, have been saying, kind of like, I like hanging out with you, and the other one says, well, I like hanging out with you too, and then the next thing you know, their two hands touch. And then there's that hot, sweaty moment on the palms of the hands. Like, wow, I didn't think that, uh, I thought we were just friends, but this means now we're a couple because we just connected, Right? And there's a word for that. It's called storge. We belong together. We belong together. That kind of love. And, and, and then there's this one called agape. I am sacrificially committing myself to you. Sacrifice, commitment. I am going to seek out and do the highest good for you. And that word is used for God's love for us. And we find it in John 3.16. God so loved the world. <laughs> wow, this is great. And then there's this other one that's not found in the New Testament. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's called eros, and that's the one that's so popular in our country. It's the one called passionate erotic love. It's the world's kind of love. It's so worldly that it's even left out of the New Testament and only found in the Old Testament uh, for when uh, Hadassah appeared before a king, Ahasuerus or Xerxes. And uh, it tells us that she found grace in his eyes in Hebrew, but, but the translators into the Septuagint called that, not grace, but called it eros. She was drop-dead gorgeous. And something happened inside. He says, wow. Out of all the women in the kingdom, she's it. And see, it's all on the external, the physical, whereas God's love is greater than that. It's not about you pleasing me. It's about me sacrificing and being committed to you. God's love. There's a theology of God's love. That's what I want to talk about for just a few moments. The theology of God's love. God is the essence of love. What I'm going to try to tell you today is that you cannot really know love if you don't know God. Boom. That's it. Jesus talks about world's love, 
you know, that he loved them, but not like the world loves. So there's a worldly love, and that's, what, that's the kind of thing that King Ahasuerus or Xerxes had for the guy later called Esther, her Hebrew name was Hadassah. He had that external, physical infatuation, um, kind of like in all the Hollywood movies. Meet person, so attracted to each other. Next scene. I mean, they meet at the bar, they go home, they're in bed together. It's, there's no substance to it. It's all me, 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 me. I want to start by saying God is the essence of love, so different from what the world is teaching. He says in this passage, in John, John, 1 John 4, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If you're going to really truly love agape style, like God loves, you've got to know God. And we all, he says, and so we know and we rely on, on the love God has for us. God is love. Did you notice twice God is love? God is love. Now, in the world, here's the standard. Love is way out there somewhere. Try to get somebody to find it, they can't do it. Right, they just can't. But the, here's the thing. I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> they're, they're waiting for some feeling to overwhelm them, and that's, that's love. That's love. And see, and because I got this idea that there's this love out there somewhere, somewhere, that God, he measures up to my standard of what I think love is, <clears throat> But most people don't. Most people don't stand up to that. They don't measure up to that. You see, God reaches that high standard but, uh, that I've set up, but nobody else does. Our, our love doesn't do that. But this is all wrong. It's wrong from the get-go. I don't decide what love is that God's got to conform to. In fact, most people have it so messed up, they will say, and you'll hear this, my God would never do anything like that. My God would never send someone to hell. You see, they have a standard for God, and the God that they, they have in their mind wouldn't do those things because I am bigger than God, and I would never do that. I'm really messed up. They don't really get a grasp of what's going on here. Um, that God's got to conform to what you think is love? It is so messed up in our world. If you truly love someone, you look out for them, right? If you truly love, as a politician, your citizens, you look out for them. Well, why in the world would you defund the police? Does that make any sense to you? But we, oh, but this person that is a criminal, uh, we, we want to show compassion and love and mercy and so we're, we're going to set them free so they go out and do some more crime, right? Because that's, in their opinion, the loving thing to do. Is that messed up? Gal comes into my office years ago and says, God wants me to divorce my husband. I said, what? God wants you to do that. You sure about that? She said, oh yeah. I met this other man and I am so in love with him and God is love, and he must have put the love in my heart, so I need to divorce my husband so I can love this man. Are you following me? This is really messed up. Really messed up. Why? Because, you see, they set the standard for, for love, and this is what I would do, and this is loving, but my idea of God, he's got to conform to what I think is love. But the Bible says it is just the opposite. God is love. He is the standard. God is love. If you want to love, you must conform to who and what God is. You must be holy as God is holy. You, if, you want, if you want love, you've got to love like God loves. You've got to have that sacrificial, commitment kind of love. God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't on my loveliest day that God said, oh yeah, I think I'll save Dennis. It was on my most wretched day. Because he saved sinners. This is not the way it is. The love of God is for us. 
And this is how it works. God demonstrated his love toward us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Huge commitment to us when we were not lovely at all. There was nothing good. We deserved death, damnation, hell. And God made us the object of his love. And if I'm going to love, I have to love like him, for he is love. Wow. So different from what the world promotes. So different, so different. You see, God is the source of love. Love comes from God. And if you're not connected to God, you might have love, which Jesus said, you love like the world. You've got love, but it's not God's love. You cannot love God while you're living a, a sinful lifestyle. It just doesn't happen. You are out of fellowship with God and you say, you got love? No, you don't. If you love God with all your heart, then you're loving like, like God loves. There's a theology here that God is the source of real, true love. God is also the knowledge of love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You don't even know what love is if you don't know God in order to know no love, you have to know him. That's why Hollywood has such a hard time making a Christian movie. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? I am so thankful that there's a place like Pure Flix. You can get that. On, you, know, you can stream good movies on your television. You can watch worthwhile movies. Uh, if you haven't already, you need to download the, the Chosen app and, and watch a, a the most powerful uh, depiction of the life of Jesus Christ through the eyes of his disciples called the chosen. I mean, you, you, the world does not like that. It takes believers making good movies in order to have a movie of real good value and moral worth today. Whoever does not love does not know God. You can't love if you don't know God. This, this is back and forth. Because God is love. Because God is love. Now, the revelation of God's love. I, I thought for revelation, I even thought maybe I could put a door up here, you know. And What's behind door number one? And have you all guessing? Well, this is door number one, okay. What's behind door number one? And you're all curious what I'm going to have behind door number one, aren't you? And I'm going to open door number one. Oh, in a minute. There we go. It's the revelation of God's love. God revealed his love in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. There is no, no more supreme demonstration of the love of God than in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Boy, the, the guy that's writing this sounds like the same guy that wrote John 3.16. You know what I'm saying? Well, because it is the same guy. <laughs> John, who wrote John 3.16, writes this. He sent his only son. In fact, the word only son, get this, is only begotten son. Sounds a whole lot more like John 3, 16, when you read it that way. God showed his love among us, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, oh, that he sent his, one and only, his only begotten son into the world. Well, you see, God so loved the world. You see, it's the same thing, just rearranged. Oh, my goodness. That we might live through him, that we might have everlasting life. The only thing's mission here, that we, we might not perish. But that's like a given if you've got eternal life. God reveals his love in the person of Jesus Christ. And we, we begin celebrating Advent in just three weeks. We're going to celebrate the coming of God's Son into the world, who is the only begotten Son. I like that term, but most modern translations have gotten rid of it because it's so confusing to modern day readers that you would think that he was like the only one and uh, then you come across a passage like Hebrews eleven seventeen, where Abraham offered up his only begotten son, Isaac. You know the glitch here? There's a little glitch. Abraham had another son. 
His son was Ishmael. How can he be the only begotten if he already had a son? Wow, this, is, this just blows our minds because how could you do that? Well, the word only begotten is really unique. One of a kind. No one else like him. How was, how was it that Isaac was so uniquely different than Ishmael? And it's very simple. Isaac was the son according to the promise of God. And that made him unique. And so what this passage is saying, he sent his one and only, his unique son, the one who is the son of God, into the world. He's talking about the second person of the eternal trinity is called the son. And he came into the world at Christmas and lived among us. Wow, this is this is the revelation of God's love. That's how much he loved you, that God himself became man, came to earth, and he came for a purpose. This is the revelation of God's love. He sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice, what the next verse says. This is love. Not that we should love God, that we love God. But that he loved us, and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here we go again. This is a theme that he'd already brought up. John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2. It says there that he is propitiation for our sins. Oh, he is an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here he's got, he is, God sent his son as a propitiation, atoning sacrifice for our sins. And we talked back then about how the word propitiation is a word we don't use very much anymore. And so all the translations are using atoning sacrifice, but it really doesn't fit very well. And you say, why do you got that box with angels up there to depict this atoning sacrifice? Very simple. The box was about the size of our Lord's Supper table. And just like it depicts there, it had a, it had a lid. This doesn't have a lid. It's, it's nailed down. <laughs> but at a lid, it would come off. And inside was the Ten Commandments. Inside was a pot of, of manna. Inside was Aaron's rod that budded when he went before uh, Pharaoh. Uh, he had those things inside. The law of God was inside. And, and above it, it uh, there was this lid. And that was called the propitiation. The lid. They had these two angels with arc, 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 arching wings so they touched in the middle. And so the high priest would go in once a year and he would sprinkle blood on that lid called the propitiation. It was also called the mercy seat. And there a sacrifice of atonement was made because inside the box was the law that the nation Israel had broken. A holy God is dwelling in the midst of a sinful people. They violated the law and the wages of sin is death. They should all die. But once a year, the, the priest would bring in the blood and he'd sprinkle it there and God would look down upon it and say, that covers it for a year. One year. Next year again, the priest would have to make a sacrifice for himself first and then he'd go in and he'd, he'd do the ceremony all over to, because the people that year broke all the laws of God and, and he'd sprinkle over and make a covering, make a covering, make a covering. When you made that covering for sin, you were doing a propitiation, you were atoning sacrifice. Hebrews tells us, and we'll see this in our Advent season, that Jesus appeared once at the end of the age to take away sin, not to cover sin, but to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the priest who officiated the sacrifice, and he himself was the sacrifice. When he died on the cross, that lid, when he died on the cross, Jesus cried out to telestai. That's in the Greek. It is finished, is the way most translations put it. It's in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense means it stands being finished. Once for all. I love this passage. It actually means paid in full. It's like, uh, you know, when you buy your car and you take it out on the five-year plan. <laughs> Boy, I remember when it was a two-year plan, then a three-year plan, and now it's a five-year plan. Can you imagine, at the end, of that last one, you, you make that last payment. What's the feeling inside? Hallelujah! 
The bank is not bleeding me dry anymore for this obsolete car I'm now driving. <laughs> you get the document, it's been stamped on there, paid in full. That's what Jesus cried on the cross. He was making propitiation. He was paying in full the demand of a just God that sin have the consequences of death. He died in our place. He made propitiation for sin. He said this, this is the love of God. This is how it was, was revealed. This is how it's demonstrated. God sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice. Now, that, that brings us to the obligation that, that of God's love. It says here, we are to love one another. Dear friends, since God so loved the world, we ought to love one another. Wait a second. What's the standard? <laughs> the way God loved the world. You know that person you just don't like? Okay, come on. Anybody right now thought of somebody saying, yeah, I kind of don't like that person. <laughs> You're not raising your hands because uh, I know nobody wants to say, yeah, there's this person that irritates the daylights out of me. I just, boy, you know, if they were just to move on to some other state, would make my life really wonderful. You're all smiling and laughing. You wouldn't raise your hands, but you know what I'm talking about. Listen, he says, we ought to love that person, love one another. just like God loved me. God didn't love me when I was wonderful. You know, Lord, I'm going to be such an asset to you. Are you kidding me? I'm a sinner. I deserve death. And God says, no, no. I'm going to shower you with my love. We ought to. We have a moral obligation because God loved us. We have a moral obligation to love other people who are not lovely. And you can love the ones who are lovely too. But I think the focus here is we love like God did. We prefer other people. We sacrifice for other people. He wants us to show God's love. If we love one another, he goes on, and he says there's a reason for this because God is a God of triunity and all are involved in loving you. Oh, this is amazing. We know that we live in him and he lives in us because he has given us his spirit. I was eight years old. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. My life changed. But I'll tell you what, I did not feel the Holy Spirit enter me. But he did. How do I know? The Bible says so. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. But I didn't belong to him, so I had to have the Spirit of Christ. He invaded me. He made my body his temple. My temple is the body of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He says, listen, we know that we live in Him, that I'm in Christ, and He is in me because He has given us His Spirit. His Spirit resides within me. And it says, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son. The Father is involved in the Spirit and with the Son to be the Savior of the world. The entire Trinity is involved in the love that God has for me. And the love that God has for you. The Father loves you. The Son loves you. The Holy Spirit loves you. Wow. Isn't that amazing? In fact, all three are in you. He'll go on to say that as he talks about the indwelling of God's love. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him. He's referring to God here as the God the Father. God the Father lives in me. Wait, my temple, my body is temple of the Holy Spirit. And God the Father lives me. Wow. And I live in Him. Isn't that amazing? I live in Him. He's in me. In the book of Ephesians, it says that Christ dwells in my heart by faith. So the triune God is in me. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, they're all in me. They're indwelling in this body. And so what I do with my body is very important to God because he no longer dwells in the buildings like this, temples and sanctuaries. No, in the age in which we live, he lives inside me, inside you. He lives inside those who confess him. If anyone 
acknowledges. Some translations have confess him. What is the confession? Peter gave it. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? They gave some other alternatives. And then, then he looked at Peter and said, and who do you say that I am? He said, actually, to all the 12, and Peter's the only one who spoke up. He was a spokesman. He said, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's exactly what John's talking about here. You confess him to be the Christ. He lives in believers. He says, so we have come to know and to believe the love of God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in him, and God abides in him. Oh, he lives in us. Abiding, he lives in us. He lives in the believer. The love lives in us. The love is in us. The love is in us. I just don't understand why there's so many angry, cantankerous Christians. When the love of God is inside us. We have a hard time getting it out. Romans chapter 5 says, I'm justified. And in that justification process, God poured out his love. The love of God is poured out by the Holy Spirit into my heart. So it's in there. But I got to get it out. I choose to love and allow the love of God in me to go to those who I think don't even deserve it. That's what God does. That's what's in me. Let's look at the character of God's love. The character of God's love, it says it completes us. It says, in this way, love is made complete. The word for complete here is the word to reach its intended goal. God loved you, and he's got an intended goal for you. So that that love he put in you, he's got a goal for you to get it out and actually target and use it specifically to help and do something in the world. You're to share the love of God in your life. So he's made it complete among us so that we, will, we have confidence on the day of judgment. I'm going to have confidence in the day of judgment. I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be confident because in this world we are like him. I, people should see Jesus in me. Peter talks about them asking the reason of hope that lies within you. Why would they ask that? Because the Christian lives his life so differently. People say, why are you doing what you do? And you're supposed to say, because Jesus loves me. <laughs> and I love Jesus. And my whole life is changed. Because of the love of Jesus in my heart. He goes on, he says, there is no fear in love. No fear. If you're in a relationship and you're afraid of the person, it's hard to be in love with the person because you're afraid of the person. There is no fear in love. Now, if there's real love in the relationship, you won't be afraid. It's just that simple. You won't be afraid the person's going to beat you. You're not afraid the person's going to cheat you. You're not afraid. You just go down the list. They're not, you're not afraid they're going to leave you. You just, you just name it. Because if real love is in the relationship, that stuff's gone. And when there's real love in a relationship with God, you realize God is not out to get me. He loves me. <laughs> there are a lot of religions based upon fear making you afraid. I mean, really making you afraid, so you're afraid of God. Now, there's a proper place for fear. We covered that last summer. It's a, it's a reverence for God and who he is. Like, I always feared my dad when I was a kid, but I knew he loved me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, there is no fear in love, but perfect love. When you've got God's love in you, it drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. God is not out to get you. Jesus took your punishment. God loves you. The one who fears is not made perfect in the love. They just really haven't grasped the full love of God. So they stand in fear. You see, real love is fearless, fearless, fearless. That's what this verse is saying. It's fearless. Then he says in the 19th verse, we love him. We love because he first loved us. Prior to my loving him, he loved me. There's something wrong with this. You just have to put up with it. <laughs> I can't stand still. <laughs> God loves us. 
First, it's honest too. Real love is honest. It does not lie. I did research on how relationships fall apart for a program that I wrote years ago. It always starts with a secret. You hide something from the other person in the relationship. And the person who first hides something from their spouse is usually the ultimate cause of a broken relationship. If you just get it out, you could overcome it. And so they live a lie of secrecy. If anyone says, I love God yet hates his brother, he's a liar. Okay, you can say it all you want. You can use all the words you want about how you love, but if you don't, you're a liar. And anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, he cannot love God whom he has not seen. Whoa, you're a liar if you say you love God and you're hating your neighbor. You're a liar if you say you love God and you've got a beef with somebody in the church. You're a liar if you say you love God and you fill in who it is that is on your most despicable list. It's honest. It's almost also obligated. This second time I'm talking about obligation. It says, and, and he has given us a command, whoever loves God must, there it is, the obligation right there, you must love his brother. Now I got a jury summons here. Usually when you get a summons, you know you have to go. <laughs> you have to go. This is God's love summons. You have to love. <laughs> when you do, they will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. Isn't that great? That's great. You're obligated. Let me sum this all up. <clears throat> God is love. And God's love sets Christianity apart from all other or, uh, uh, religions. Christianity is different from all the others because it speaks of a God who loves you and about a grace giving you what you don't deserve and a mercy withholding from you what you do deserve. Christianity is unique. There's no other religion like it. We love God because he first loved us. He loved me, sent his son, and I got the message and I respond by giving my life to Christ and now I love him, but he first loved me. He first loved me. Why? Because God is love. God is love. Now, I'm wrapping this all up, but I, finally, I would be totally remiss on this Sunday if I did not say this. God loves cheerful givers. Oh, you guys know where I'm going, don't you? This is Pledge Sunday. God so loved the world that he gave, and God loves a cheerful giver. He, and he's talking about giving to the Lord, giving back to him. He loves when we give back to him. Not because we've got to, but because we want to. So he says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly, nor under compulsion, not because anybody's forcing you. We force no one here to give. And we don't feel anyone should be giving if they're reluctant about it and saying, you know, I'm not so sure I should be doing this. No, you settle that in your mind, and then you give, and God loves a cheerful giver. In fact, the verse before that even says, whoever sows sparingly, you, you sow a little seed, you know. I, I, I put out a garden when I was about... I don't know, 10 years old, and I, I got it for Christmas, all these seeds, and then at the right time, my dad told me to plant them. I had this little thing in my bedroom window. We put them in there, and then as they came from seeds a little bigger, we took them out to the garden, and then we put it, I had this little patch of a garden, and, and it grew, and it says, whoever sows sparingly. If I'd only put some of the seeds in, only some of the seeds would have grown. Put all the seeds in, they all grow. It just makes sense. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his own heart to give to God, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The Amplified Version puts, God loves a hilarious giver. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I love to give to God. <laughs> yeah, God loves a 
cheerful giver. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are overwhelmed by your love. And, and you have told us that we are now obligated to love others just like you loved us because we go by your name. We're Christians. Lord, you told us you love uh, cheerful givers. May we be cheerful givers. Giving to the Lord is an act of worship to say, thank you, God, for giving your son for me. I give this tiny little portion back to you to say I love you. Receive it as such, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.